This is an interview with Reverend J.P. Parnell of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute's Oral History Project. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. We are presently at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Today is October 1st, 1997. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, first of all, to come and sit with me and talk about uh, your activities in the Birmingham Civil Rights Movement, as well as your life in general. Uh, welcome to the Institute. I'd just like to start by asking you, were you are you originally from Birmingham? No. Okay. Where are you originally from? I'm from Uniontown, Alabama. And your parents, were they from Uniontown? They are from Uniontown. Okay. Um, what was your, the, the level of education that your parents had? Oh, my parents, my mother should have had the third grade. Mm -hmm. Or my father may have been the second grade. Were they uh, homeowners? Well, no. They was a crop. Sharecroppers. Uh -huh. uh, how many brothers and sisters did you have? Do I have? Did you have, you know, in growing up? Oh, I have uh, one brother and one sister. Oh, uh, yeah, small family. Yeah, okay. very small. Well, what do you remember about those early days in in Union Union Town, right? And now in Union Town, those early days, my grandmother read me until she passed mm -hmm. and uh, my mother was moved to Birmingham my father also was here mm -hmm. and uh, those other days was most difficult mm -hmm. so you stayed in Uniontown with your grandmother I stayed there with my grandmother until she passed okay. and then you came to, to Birmingham no I stayed with this uncle and that uncle I see. Uh -huh. And uh, it was most difficult. Yeah. Did your grandmother work? My grandmother was very old and, and uh, she worked some in the farm, along the farm. I see. Uh -huh. And uh, she was a great spirit. Uh -huh. For a long time, I said she was the only person in the world that really loved me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but she died mm -hmm. when I was very young. How was that before you started school? Oh, she, well, I, uh, I would think so. It mm -hmm. was early in my very early. Very early in my life. Okay. What do you remember about your first days in school? Well, uh, my days in school, uh, I shared many great memory of those days because it was a little one room school, one teacher for all of the children. And uh, I usually would stand at the head of my class. Did, how, did, how far did you live from the school? I was five miles. So how did you get there? Every I had to walk there yeah. in the rain, in the snow or whatever. I didn't have uh, such as a raincoat or umbrella, but I had to make, I had to walk there. You walk there and walk back every walk day? Walk there and walk back each day. Did you like school? Oh, I loved it. What did you like most about it? Well, I liked math mostly, but I just liked school. Mm -hmm. It was a I, I, it was an opportunity for me to be with other right. young people and have a teacher. I had one of the greatest teachers mm -hmm. of all of my schooling. I had one of the greatest teachers in that first one room school. This is in Uniontown. That was in Uniontown. What was the teacher's name? Mrs. Hattie Carrington. Hattie Carrington. Yes. And she made some pressure on you, obviously. Yes, she did. Yes. Uh, you say you went to that one room school. Mm -hmm. How long? Oh, 
it must have been because uh, through the eighth grade. Through eighth grade, okay. Uh -huh. And what did you do after eighth grade? Well, I came to Birmingham. When you came to Birmingham, did you live with your your, your mother and father? I know. I lived with another uncle. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, they, you, helped, they helped me through. Okay. What school did you attend? Oh, well, now I attend uh, uh, Parker at night okay. at Birmingham Baptist Bible College. Right. When you came up, though, if you were after you just left Uniontown, yeah. did you go to work? Or? Yeah, I worked at Tennessee. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I worked at Alabama Fuel and Iron Company in Overton. Mm -hmm. And you were an eighth grader at that time. Yeah, so, I, was at, I was in the eighth grader promoted to the ninth. Uh -huh. And you're out working? I'm working mm -hmm. and going to school. And going to school. And going, yes. Uh, where, where was your first job? My first job was in the mine. Coal mine? Coal mine. When I was very young. But that was the only opportunity that I had. And my uncle took me with him. And I worked in What it. was that experience like? What was working in uh, the at a young age? I, I, well, the first suit I ever bought, the first this I ever bought, and I never had any money before. And it was exciting. Mm, okay. Uh, and how long did you work in the mine? I worked in the mine a year. Mm -hmm. and, what, and then I was able to get on at Republic Steel on my record right. there. What did you do at Republic Steel? Well, I did a little of everything. I uh, worked on the labor game, I worked on the boilers, and finally, I, I got a job of Republic Steel of Carrot Mail. Mm, okay. That's the first step that I made uh, somewhat upward. Yes. Well, did you make more money at Republic Steel than you did in the in the mine? I, yes, I did. Uh, and then it was difficult for me to get to the mine. See, I had to walk. I was working from four to one. And the truck pulled us off in Overton, and I had to walk all the way to Woodlawn after I got older. Okay, so you lived in Woodlawn when you first came in. You lived in Overton. In Overton. Uh huh. Okay. But uh, I moved to Woodlawn. When I moved to Woodlawn, then I had to walk, getting off that truck at one o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. I had to walk about six, seven miles. Mm -hmm. I didn't have no transportation. That but I did it. Each day I met the truck back there, went back to work. Now that's that's amazing. I mean, people really can't relate to a person today walking five miles to school and then walking to meet the truck to go to work. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's called commitment and really necessity, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so how long were you at Republic? Oh, I stayed with Republic for 10 years. I stayed there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was getting on up in age then because I was way behind, you know, being in that country school. Right. And, mm -hmm. and then coming here, you got to find a job and then you got to find a school that you can continue. Right. And it was most difficult. Mm -hmm. How did you manage it? Well, I give the credit to the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. So you went to Parker? Yeah, I went to Parker at night. At night. Okay. And I worked during the day. And uh, by the time I had finished Parker, I was called to this church that I'm pastoring now, mm -hmm. Mount Hebron. And I received a scholarship to go to Birmingham Baptist. Bible College at that time, but I mean, he's only Bible College today. Right. And uh, I went there in 1952. I graduated from there. And then I attend, uh, I attend Daniel Payne College. And 
and it took me much longer to finish that right. because I was working. Yeah. And in 1959, I finished Daniel Payne College. Yeah. During this interim, you know, between 52 and 59, a lot of things are starting to happen in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, I was part of that because uh, I think the NAACP uh, was outlawed here uh, shortly, uh, somewhere between that time. Right, in 1956, June yeah. 56, the NAACP was outlawed. outlawed. And as a result of it being outlawed, then the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights yeah, was also there. I was there. And Were you one of the founding members? Well, I was. Well, I wasn't one of those that shine on the television. Right, but I was there. there. I was there. Okay, so you were one of the founders then. You were there. Well, so. I was there. Right, right. Now, that time. I mean, those were some tough times in Birmingham. Uh, uh, those were some tough times in Birmingham. Uh, why did you get involved in the movement? Well. I've seen so much in Uniontown. That was like so, for instance. Uh, well, in Sharecroft, there was a cousin of mine who was sharecropping, and uh, he didn't make much cut that year. And he took the seed from the cotton to buy his children some shoes to go to school. And I saw and heard them as they beat him in the little common store because he took that, those seats. You saw that you witnessed of the, of the beating of the man. took the how awful kick and beat that man. And those things kept turning over. And I never forgot. It. How old were you when you when you witnessed this? Uh, 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 that was before eighth grade. Uh, that was when you were a child. Yeah, well, I should have been about seven or eight or nine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those things bothered me. But however, the movement was an opportunity for me to let my feeling be known. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh I, I accepted many responsibility. You were a minister at the time, and oh, the yeah. organization started yeah. you know, with, with uh, Reverend Salisworth and uh, Reverend Fife and other ministers. You were a young young man at the time. I'm saying the age that Reverend Shepherd was. Right. So here, here are some young upstart. Uh, Black men who are deciding that they have seen enough to know that it's time for a change. Yes. In many instances, you were not looked upon very favorably. Were you still working at that time? Yeah, I was. I was working when it began, but later I began to become a full-time pastor. But did you have any difficulties on your job when you first started? You know, well, I had difficulties. I had them. And I guess that's some of the things that pushed me on mm -hmm. out. But uh, you could see the feeling. They were very nice to me, you know, before. Mm -hmm. uh, in the office where I would go in and out. But I could feel the feeling. And uh, I had to give full time to the ministry. Okay, continue school. They helped me, and I give full time. Well, did uh, the people on your job in any way force you to give up that job? Oh, no, no, they never. You they just made a determination that it was time for you to. Yeah, that's how I made it. They didn't coach me. Right. Well, in 57 is when um, Fred Shawsworth took his children to Phillips High School. Yeah. And attempted to enroll them. And that was an amazing day because 
Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, he was attacked. His wife was, yeah. was attacked. Yeah. Uh, what, were you uh, around at that particular time? I was around. Mm-hmm. I was around. I was. I had children's too, right. and uh, my children was trying to get in Woodlaw. Mm-hmm. They didn't do it then. Mm-hmm. That year. Was this the same year that Reverend Sullivan and his children in the Phillips? Well, they mice didn't get in that. Right. Well, he just didn't either. You know? No, but, but, he, was, but he tried. He tried, right, right. Uh, when you made the attempt to get your children in, in Woodlawn, did the same thing happen with that white No, person? no. It was it, just later? It, it was a little bit better. Okay. All my children had a difficulties, you know, and going to Woodlawn, it was difficult for them. Mm-hmm. But they know how their daddy felt. And they had some fight in them. Right. So and, they and, and they persevered. Yeah, they, they persevered. And so I assume that this was then after about 1964, 65. Yeah, my children was way later, you right. know. Mm-hmm. When they went in, they went in uh, the second year okay. at Woodlawn. Right. At uh, Reverend Parker's son went in the first year, and then my son. Um, that those should have been some very interesting times as well because you're taking your child to a place that yeah yeah it, it, it's you know you're always nervous you you know mm-hmm. you're constantly right. thinking of what could happen. And you take them there and then you leave them for the day and you go yeah. and you get out. Yeah, I understand. Look, before we get to that particular point, though, you were very actively involved in the the Monday night meetings. Yes, I was actively involved. I, on Monday nights, I would go, I had a daughter, she's passed on now by the name of Barbara Phyllis Parnell. It was the one at night I was to preach at Peace Baptist. I preached all over. And that night, somebody informs somebody. And uh, when I got out of my Holiday Inn on 10th Avenue, coming out of Woodlawn, police cars surrounded me. And uh, they was having me rough. And that girl says, if you're going to kill him, you got to kill me. She stood there. Mm-hmm. She said, don't move, Dad. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, to think about it now, it brings cheap, that the kind of cold she is about. Yeah. How old was she at the time? That girl must have been about 15. Mm-hmm. But everybody else seemed to be afraid to go with me. And she would go. Mm-hmm. Everywhere that I went out, we'd go every Monday night to the movement. Mm-hmm. I would preach in the movement, and, and somebody would walk back to the car with me. Right. That night, when you were stopped by the policeman, why did they say they stopped? They said somebody informed them that I had the records of all of the ministers that was involved. And I was a Christian movement, but I never had the record. Mm-hmm. Did they arrest you? No, they just was hounding me rough, mm-hmm. looking in the trunk for it, mm-hmm. going through everything for the record. Well, did they detain you and oh, would not no. allow you to, to go to the church that you preached that night? No, mm-hmm. they, when that daughter got through talking, they talked among themselves and they said okay and we went on when you got to the meeting did you tell people what it, what has happened Big pardon? did you tell people at the church oh i told them you know some of them personal mm-hmm. and, and uh they it was just like that with me every move i made mm-hmm. 
seeming that there was something body that was, I don't know how the information would reach City Hall. But it's, it was there. They would reach City Hall and then they would react. Yeah, you see that City Hall would react to the policeman. Right, that's right. And uh, I went on church at that night and preached all I could preach. I was somewhat mixed with fear and uh, right. frustration, but I did what I could. How would you describe the average mass meeting? I would think the mass meeting was most effectively because you could go there with fear, you could go there with its courage, and you could leave there feeling very, very strong about what you believe. And I know that policemen actually set in on some of those meetings. Well, they sit in that night on me and they began to take notes. And uh, they sit in in every meeting. Every mass meeting I went to, you know, at that time, there were so many policemen sitting in, writing down, finding out who you are, where you passed. Mm -hmm. They were attempting to intimidate. Yes. People that would come. How successful were they? Were the policemen? I don't know. I I truly don't know. But uh, they were very successful with me. Because when I was at Miles College and Dr. Pitt asked me to leave the Board of Legislation Drive in Bessemer Avery, and I didn't tell anybody. I hardly mentioned it to my wife. But when I got to Bessemer, there was old oh, six, seven, eight cars of policemen there awaiting on me before I could even stop. They opened my car door. So they were very successful with me. I don't know how the information. So they had someone that was passing all the, every piece of information to them. Passing every piece. Mm -hmm. And they arrest me in Bessemer. They did arrest you in Bessemer. They what, arrest what was the charge in Bessemer. Oh, uh, uh, the stud in the piece. They locked me. They I had to sprawl over my car, and handcuff me, and I didn't have a fingernail file. Mm -hmm. And they led me to jail and took my car and locked it up. They didn't arrest nobody out of the group but me. Mm -hmm. So, information. So, you were targeted then? Huh? You were targeted. You well, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, that's that's very interesting. That um, you would be one of those that would be targeted, and and really not knowing where that information was coming from. I did know, but there's been I've interviewed other people who talked about the same thing that there were actually ministers who would take information. To the to the police department. Well, now that could have easily been because I didn't share this information openly right. with anyone. Mm -hmm. But when I got there, they they were there waiting and they locked me up. And I talked. My wife then was so disturbed. She was directoring our daycare, and she had to close up the school. Mm -hmm. And we tried to get the lawyer that. The, close out on our house in Woodlawn to come down and to get me out of barn falling. But he said he couldn't come. He was white. He couldn't come to Bessemer. <laughs> so, so how did you get out? Uh, the information was passed on to Dr. Pitts and he sent a Tony Show. Tony Show was the sort of savior at that particular time, he's one of the few black lawyers that we yeah, have. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, there were a number of events that took place. In, in 1960, of course, the student sit-in started. In yeah. 61, there was a freedom yeah. Rise. yeah. And in 62, I'm, the selective buying campaign. Does any of those things bring back any memories? Now, I went to the Greyhound bus station. And 
you're talking about, uh, I, I don't use it yet, afraid. To meet the Freedom Riders? Hey, well, yes, and to, to sit in, you know. Oh, to sit in, okay. All right. And boy, it was, I was almost, I was almost afraid. That is one of the only times. Why? Why were you? They were so vicious. They were so determined. What did they do? Oh, they were moving around and knocking, and you know, they they were some mad white folks. Was it a mob, or was it just a few? Well, I consider it was enough to consider a mob. And, mm -hmm. They are. But uh, we were able to get out of home. When you set in, well, you see, they had a, a colored and white situation. Right. And if you ever go over that to the white situation, you had violated the law. Right. And you didn't have to do anything but step on the white side. Mm -hmm. And then they become angry. And, uh, I left there. I went back home after that situation. How many of you set in? Um, Do you remember that the day that you were describing how many Oh, I don't know people? how many but I, I don't know how many of us were there. But it was it was a no oh, Lord, yes. And and you were just now of course uh the whole philosophy of nonviolence would play a, an important part in all of this. How did you feel about that? Oh, I could accept that. Uh, I could accept that. I, did you ever have any inclination to defend yourself or to strike back? I tell you, uh, that was one time that uh, I don't know. I, I was at home. And it was a Friday night. I had been to church to a teacher's meeting. And uh, I came home and some of the neighbors called me. And it was the clan who was out there demonstrating out there. And they in, called. In, I didn't even in know. In your neighborhood, in front of your house? In front of my house. And, and uh, they stood there. I don't know how many cars it was. I don't know. I just saw some got out right there in my yard. They stood there. There was a few things ran through my mind. Mm -hmm. What were the reactions of your neighbors from that? Oh, oh they were they was very concerned. They called so many other people that was related to the I don't know Christian movement and they came and they got in ditches and, or oh, they were spaced around me very sharply. I'm sorry, your neighbors did? Your neighbors so did. they were very protective of you and your family? Yeah, they were. Mm -hmm. They were protected. Some of them stayed there throughout the night. Some yeah. come, came as far as from Tibbetsville there. Right. Yeah. But uh, that was time, that was a test in time with me. I, I, uh, I stood there though, and they, I just moved the curtain back and just stood there and looked out the window. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, did you have a, a constant guard at your house? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I had people who would look out for me if I got to Woodlawn. Mm -hmm. And that area, Woodlawn would protect me, mm -hmm. those saints. Mm -hmm. I know God had to do it. But right. But the Christian and the non Christian mm -hmm. was alike. Right. And uh, I, I didn't have any more problem, mm -hmm. you know, coming to the house. Now, they came to the house when I was out of town. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody was at home but my wife and children. And they went through everything. While you were away? While I was away. I was in. Fort Wayne, Indiana, doing a ribeye. Mm -hmm. And they went through everything she had, even her underfoot. Mm -hmm. Threw things on the floor. 
But I began saying somebody informed me. Were you involved in any other organizations other than the Alabama Christian Movement? But now I was at that time the secretary of the Education Association um, that that served and operated the Birmingham Bible College and the adjacent counties. And somebody could have informed them that I was secretary of that and they didn't understand. Right. They could have assumed that it was the, the Alabama Christian Yeah, Christian sure. Secretary. That's the only thing that I can see. Mm -hmm. In uh, April and May of 1963 was the big demonstrations. What yeah. were your activities? And my activity was with the demonstration. Did you? Did you I was at 16th Street, mm -hmm. and we went up to up to this where they uh, turned the water holes on, and I was there. You were there? I was there. I was there when we went to... What was that experience like? Making that march and then seeing the police and walk well, out of the dogs? I, I, I told you, sometime after you come out of those meetings, you were encouraged to do what you had to do. The fear, I, fear, I, I, was the fear would leave. And uh, those Christian movement meeting and sharing thought was the greatest hope of breaking down the barrier. Mm -hmm. Had it not been for the meeting, had you just walked out there, you would have been able to take it. Mm -hmm. But once you were in those meetings, once you shared ideas in those meetings and walked out, you could stand and you didn't fear for your life. Were you arrested during this period? Arrested during, 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 during the demonstrations? Were you, were you arrested during oh, the demonstrations? I was arrested the only investment. Only investment. Only investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, you know, ever threatened. But you know, there was still some white people that was kind to me. And where our pastor is a little out of section. I don't guess you know anything about Irondale. I know a about Irondale. I pastor there, this is my 48th year. And uh, I had a white, some white friends there. In the church? Not in the church, but in the community. That when they decided to say, when they discussed me to do me in Bartlett Hall, they spoke up for me. So I don't, I, I didn't have a lot of bitter experience, mm -hmm. other than there were fear even driving home. Right. What what uh, did your wife think about all this? Well, we were all we. She, if I, if she thought that I felt that this was the thing to do, she would do it. She wouldn't question it. Mm -hmm. She would be. Was, was she active? She was active. Mm -hmm. Unless we had children, I had some children that was really afraid. And then she would stay with those children, and I'll take the one with me. Right. But my wife and I would be together. Did you have other relatives that were involved? Who? Other relatives other than your Yeah, family? I had one son who, <laughs> he, he went, he was a student at Hayes, and he closed the whole school down. Very good. Mm -hmm. He closed it down and he took him and led him down to City Hall and bowed down on his knees. Mm -hmm. Did did you know that he was going to do that before he did it? I wasn't quite sure. I was afraid that he was going to do it. If he had come to you and said that, well, I probably would, would have said no because the boy was ill. Mm -hmm. 
he was ill, and I would have been protected with his help. But he did that, and he, every room, the principal called me and told me every room, he went there and opened the door and said, don't you want to be free? Come on now. And they all walked from Hayes. When the principal came to you and told you what had happened, what did you, what was your? Well, I could say nothing because, you see, uh, I had been encouraging the children to think for themselves. Right. And uh, I didn't say anything, so they gave me the most, so the most difficult problem. They put him out of school for it, mm -hmm. and they say, "Can I enter back in this school?" I said, "Oh yes, he's going back." Mm -hmm. So we battled for a day or two, and I had a friend over the education. So, oh yeah. But he couldn't go back to Hayes because he turned his school out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had to go to Urban. Okay. And Mr. Bell told me over at Urban that he's not going to run this school. <laughs> <laughs> Was he arrested? No. The boy? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We had to get him out. And I got out a lot of more of them. Exactly. Uh, a lot of them. Yes, we had to get him out. We remember. My wife couldn't sleep well because she was worried that he would get a year in it. Yeah. How, how long was he in jail? Oh, the first day was a little hard to get him out. He must have been in jail about two days. <laughs> so and he did not have his illness? No, no, he didn't have that illness. What well, kind of illness? He had a seizure. Oh. And, uh, that troubled me a lot, you know. Right. Right. But uh, he, he, I don't know whether it's the jail helped him, but he hadn't had it, you know. <laughs> he's now 52 years old, if he's right. the one good. Yeah, yeah. So he, he didn't have one in, in, in and, jail. And, 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 and he hadn't had one as far as my knowledge since then. So. I mean, that's what he needed. <laughs> he go to jail and get that. That was, that was the antidote, I guess. Yeah, well. I was nervous over it. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think has been the, the greatest accomplishment of the movement? Uh, again, it kept before the people the condition of the black. They kept that before. Mm -hmm. And I think it's inspired the greatest accomplishment of this movement was to awaken Birmingham to know where they were and uh, where they should be. And I think that was it. I don't think the guns, the dogs, I, oh, they made it ugly with the dogs. They made it ugly with the water hole. They brought sympathy from all over this country. Right. They helped. It was an ugly. They made it ugly with 16th Street bombing, but it helped. But to inspire people, right. marching under the banner, of nonviolence. The day of the 16th Street bombing, where were you? Where was I? Yes. I was getting ready to go to church when I did. And uh, we, uh, we came down to 16th Street. You were living in Woodlawn at the time? Yes. That's quite a distance from 16th Street. Can you heard it? Uh, I, I, don't mean I, I don't mean I heard the black, but I heard about what had I happened. Okay. And when you got over here, you see, came over? Yes. What was the scene? Well, yeah, but when I got here, they had moved everything. Mm -hmm. and they, I didn't see any, you know, the happening. Right. The previous month, there had been the, watch on, the march on Washington. I was there. 
Tell me about that. Yeah. How did you get that? Oh, I on a bus. Mm -hmm. On a bus, I just didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But they shared me enough money to go to Washington, mm -hmm. with the march on Washington. What was that experience? Well, that was great. I stood with so many people. As far as I could see, it was nothing but people. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, those kind of meetings was, I think, was the greatest effect on racism and anything that we do. What about the Selma March? The Selma March, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. With the seven march, I don't know why, but I wasn't there. If you had the ability to change anything during the movement, what would you change? During the movement, yes, sir. Oh, I don't know. I, I tell you, I like everything. <laughs> well, you may not change anybody. No. I, I don't know of anything that I could have done that would made it any better. What do you think the legacy of the movement would be? Or has been? Big part of the legacy. What do you think that it has done over time? Uh, well, I, I try not to get in that negative. It's, uh, no, not negative. I'm talking about what has what has the movement done to help prepare Birmingham for what it's going to be later on. Oh. I think the movement has, has prepared Birmingham, has prepared the white to accept the black, and has prepared the, the black to accept the white. I think had it not been for the movement, I think we'd been still badly. I think that preparation was needed, and it had to come before we start totally mixing. What would you like to to say to the people that may view this tape uh, about, about the movement and as it relates to what is taking place in the city today? Is there anything that that we can learn from what happened during that time that would enhance where we are uh, in racial terms of that. Well, I said that to say that many of our young blacks have failed in accepting and seeing the vision of the total movement. And I'm saddened by some of the things that I see and I hear. And I wonder sometimes, did it really pay for the suffering, the fear, the frustration that we went through there? And to see our backs turning their back on everything, but mostly everything that we thought were valuable to lift the raise, to make strong men and strong women, they are turning their back on. And this, I don't know. Uh, and the message that back then, 63, is not good. If it hurt, it's not accepted. And our message today I, I don't know where we are going, and I'm sad. All of this killing each other, black on black, and all our situation is somebody said we should now. Are there any positive uh, things that may be happening now? Yes, there are some positive coordinates. Young people? Yeah, for instance, there is a young man there. He's a manager. And, 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 uh, he's, and he's 
Who is this young man? And this is my grandson. Okay. And he's manager and he carries it with dignity mm -hmm. and with respect. And I'm very proud of him. And I think there are many more of them mm -hmm. that uh, are doing equal as good a job or better in some instance. But we are proud of those young people that are reaching up. They are not all going the opposite direction. Uh, Reverend Pond, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule. You've helped us an awful lot. You've given us some insight on movement and on life in general. Thank you very much. Okay.